Hi everyone, welcome to the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book, presenting a virtual school visit with Juana Medina. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before we begin. First, please share your questions for the author using the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we will get to as many as possible at the end of today's event. Also, this event has closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you'd like to rewatch this event later, it will be available along with other videos from festival speakers at vabook.org slash watch. Now, I'm pleased to introduce today's featured author. Juana Medina, author and illustrator of multiple children's books, including the chapter book series Juana and Lucas, was born and grew up in Bogota, Colombia. At school, she got into trouble for drawing cartoon versions of her teachers. How, eventually, however, all that drawing and trouble paid off. Welcome, Juana. Uh, in her new book, Juana's life in Colombia is just about perfect. Every now and then a big problem comes along, like having to learn English or her mom getting remarried. But things eventually settle down and life goes back to feeling pretty perfect again. But then her mom springs two surprises on Juana. One, Juana will be spending her school break going to skating camp instead of relaxing. And two, her mom is going to have a baby. How can one Juana-sized person handle so many changes? Juana, tell us more. Sarah, hi, thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as you heard from Sarah, my name is Juana Medina, and I am the author of a book series called Juana and Lucas. And this is the first book in the series, which you might be familiar with. There's also big problemas. Um, and this is the third book in the series called Juana and Lucas, Muchos Changes. As you just heard, there's some big changes in Juana's life. And I thought I would share a little bit of the book with all of you. Um, so here we go. Chapter one, my name is Juana. I live in Bogota, Colombia with my best amigo, Lucas. Not only is Lucas my most special friend, but he's also the best perro ever. And here we see Juana enjoying some empanadas, and delicious pastries with her dear dog and friend, Lucas, in her beloved Bogota. Let's pass the page and keep reading. We live with Mommy and Luis. When Mommy and Luis decided to get married, not everything was easy at first but it has all worked out just fine. I'm okay with mommy marrying Luis. Why? Porque they love each other. Also, I get to listen to Luis's jazz collection and eat his special roasted Brussels sprouts whenever he makes them. I love repollitas. Repollitas is how we call Brussels sprouts in Bogota. I love repollitas even more than cheese and ice cream. Lucas is also okay with us living all together in our new casa. And so we get a peek into Juana's new casa. Here she is about to enjoy her dinner. And this is mommy right here and Louise serving the Brussels sprouts. And Lucas a little more interested in anything that might fall from the sky in the kitchen while delicious things are being cooked. I'm gonna pass the page. And here's part of the big new, one of the big new changes. What I'm not that excited about is mommy's latest sorpresa. She's pregnant. This means there will soon be a baby in the house. Mommy and Luis are very excited about this news and they can't stop talking about it. Lucas and I, meanwhile, would much rather talk about other things like football or musica or even the ever-changing Bogota weather. In Bogota, there are no seasons. So it's very rainy up in the mountains and it always stays around 60 or 70 degrees all year round. And so here we can see Juana's mommy, very excited sharing the news. Luca's kind of curious about what is going on and Juana, Juana doesn't seem all that thrilled hearing the news. And so she decides to go on a walk with her beloved Lucas, even in a rainy afternoon. Let's pass the page here. The thing I'm very excited about is school break. For weeks, 
I won't have to worry about Mr. Tompkins, hurrah, or about all the difficult math we're learning, or about wearing my itchy uniform. Hopefully none of you have to wear an itchy uniform, bravo. And so here we see Juana in her underpants, throwing out that itchy skirt and that blazer. She's very excited. And here jumping in a pool, she's also very happy shouting, woohoo. Lucas doesn't seem all that thrilled about it. He's a little skeptical of getting all that wet. During school breaks, I rest, read, explore, and play with Lucas. Nothing is better than that, nada. Perhaps we'll go swimming and visit my abuelos and go see Tia Cris and make some pottery together. I might even go on sleepovers with Cami and Pipe, like we've done so many times. Chapter two. It turns out I got excited about my school break a little too soon. Mommy had another sorpresa for me. She signed me up for skating camp. A few weeks ago, I received a pair of skates as a gift from Luis and Mommy. I was happy about them at first, but now I'm a little less feliz. So here we see the fancy box the skates came in. I'd much rather have my feet on the ground than wobble and roll around on top of those weird patines. Adding wheels makes it much harder for me to stay upright. And here's Juana flat on the ground. Thankfully, Lucas is helping her, but she's not that happy as you can see in her face. All right, so hopefully I'm gonna stop right here, but I really hope you can find this book in libraries and bookstores near you so that you can keep on reading. I won't spoil the whole story for you. Um, but I wanted to share that book because um, it is based on things that happened to me when I was a kid and when I was growing up. And I like bringing that up to remind especially young readers of how important it is to keep in mind all those things we're experiencing and feeling because they matter and they are so important. They could even end up in a book or in a movie or in theater or in a dance. Uh, and there are many, many ways for us to share those stories of things that are going on in our lives. And that is important because stories, I strongly believe, allow us to understand one another so much better. Um, so do share your stories, write them, illustrate them, um, and maybe they could even end up in a book someday, which I really, really hope will happen. Um, I see some comments, and I see that you're very active on the chat, which makes me really happy, and I thought maybe uh, we could draw together. So to make best use of the chat, I was hoping maybe some of you could share three different animals. So can you type a few animals that maybe come to mind? And we'll see what is being shared, a cat. All right, let me find a pencil right here. I see a cat, a pig, and a bunny. Okay, great. Thank you so much for all those ideas. That's fantastic. And now I will ask instead of animals for three different vehicles. So it could be a submarine, a hot air balloon, trains, skates, bikes, trucks, you, whatever you think about. So I see a bike and oh my goodness, so many ideas, a submarine. Okay. And uh, let's see. Oh, so many ideas coming through. This is amazing. Uh, I can't even focus on one. A raft. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, you are very fast at typing. That's so amazing. All right, so we have a cat, a pig, a bunny, and a bike, a submarine, and a raft. Thank you for all the ideas. I see someone is very excited sharing about a Tesla. Maybe another time we'll draw a Tesla. Uh, all right, so we have a cat, a pig, and a bunny, and a bike, a submarine, and a raft. Hmm, where to start? I'll start by sharing my screen so that you can see what I'm about to draw. 
let's see. So I'm sharing and now you can see I have my paper or equivalent of paper so that I can draw. And how about we start with a pig on a raft? I don't think I've ever drawn a pig on a raft, but there's always a chance for a new idea. So thanks again for sharing this. This pig seems a little relaxed. That's good. There's one log and another log. This piggy has a leg in the water. I hope there's no piranhas or sharks in that water. And let's continue drawing this raft. We need more and more logs. Maybe one more. Let's see. It doesn't seem like this pig needs a very large raft to stay afloat. One more log right here. And maybe they have some sort of oar or stick or something to help navigate these active rapid waters and now let's draw the face of our friend pig here oh he's enjoying the nice weather it seems let's fix his ear a little bit and there's one right here and now he has a little or if they have a little bandana and there we go. That's our piggy, the tail before I forget. And maybe this raft has some sort of sail. I don't know. I don't know how effective a sail this might be, but let's find out. This pig is using some shorts as a sail. And maybe those shorts could have some parts on them. Maybe they're underpants or shorts. I don't know. I don't know if you've ever seen a piggy on a raft, but that is the fun thing about being able to use our imagination and our creativity for drawing and starting stories and using stories in new ways. Well, it seems like it's windy. That's good. And let's draw some more water here. There we go. Um, maybe we can draw something on, maybe it's a polka dots on his bandana. All right. Seems like that piggy is surely enjoying that nice time on a raft. Not adrift, not lost, at least not for now. Excellent. Thank you so much for helping me. Now we have a piggy on a raft and we still have a cat and a bunny and a bike and a submarine. So I'm going to stop sharing this pig and switch layers so that we can now draw maybe a ooh, a bunny on a submarine. Let's see. So this submarine is very large. Very rounded, it seems. And let's draw some windows, right? So that they can see underwater. And let's find out who is part of this big expedition under the sea. There's one bunny and here's another bunny. 
of a hat. And we need to make sure that they have plenty of food aboard because it seems like they are getting ready for a nice journey for a while. More carrots and more carrots and more carrots. There's a ton of carrots. I hope they don't, they're well refrigerated. All right. Oof, they have tons of food in there. That's great. And let's draw a few more bunnies. Maybe there's a bunny here that is sleeping, snoring. There we go. And there's a bunny here that is reading. So we barely see those eyes and some hands and some letters of the writing of a newspaper. All right, and maybe we see an eye here. Now let's draw the water. And we see some bubbles knowing that they're moving in the ocean. Maybe there's a shark right here. Enjoying a nice swim in the ocean. There's a shark and maybe here we see a whale or part of a whale. There's the eye and maybe we see an octopus around here with all its legs and tentacles. And we see an eye. All right, and some smaller fish. All right, that seems like a nice adventure. Maybe we can see here oh, a pirate's treasure. Tons of things going under the surface. A lot of gold coins and maybe a necklace. And maybe there's some some algae growing around it. It's been buried for a long time and we see some sand. So again, we can use our imagination to create new things or things that might not exist in reality, but that we can draw and envision in our imagination. And we still have one more idea. It was a cat, right? And a bike. I love bikes so much. So let's switch layers and start drawing our bike. So here we go. One and two. I've been drawing a lot of bikes because I'm working right now on a book about an elephant that is learning how to ride a bike. And as the elephant is learning how to ride a bike, I'm learning better and better how to draw bikes, which I find particularly hard to do. So hopefully I'll do a decent job drawing this bike. Okay, so we have the main structure of the bike. See, I already drew this sort of different from what bikes tend to be like. This goes a little shorter like this, and this goes like this, but since we're using our imagination, I think it's okay if we draw a bit of a different bike. And let's give this bike a nice big basket for something our friend cat could be carrying. And now we're missing the pedals, but we have a problem. 
I don't think cats have very long legs. So we need to solve this problem somehow. And again, using our imagination, we'll need to figure out a way for the cat to ride this bike. Or maybe it turns out there's more than one cat. So I'm going to add another layer and I'm going to draw here one leg and another hind leg and one arm and a head and another arm and a long tail. And now we need to draw another cat down here with the other petal. Maybe this cat is keeping his eyes open just in case to know exactly what they're go where they're going, right? That might be a good idea. And let's draw a long tail, maybe a little straighter than the other one. So we have two cats on the back pedaling. That's helpful. I'm just going to erase these lines so that they don't confuse us too much. And so that we can see the cats a little bit easier. Here's the cat. The other cat is behind the bar, so we might not see all the details from it, but that's okay. And now, we are going to need a cat steering the bike, right? To make sure they don't crash. So I'm going to make another layer and I think we're going to need a cat right here, sitting on the handlebars, one leg and part of the body and the head. Maybe this cat has glasses like me and so many of us and another leg down here seems like this cat is having fun let's draw a tail back here and i think one thing these cats are going to need just for the sake of safety is a few helmets right so I'm just going to erase some lines so that we see better what I've put together here with your help. And then we're going to give them helmets so that in case of an accident, everybody stays safe, right? So let's give this cat a nice helmet right there. And this kitty also another helmet. This one has dots. Make sure to secure it, fasten it. And this cat also has a helmet right here. Ah, now I feel so much better. Here are our cats going on a ride. Let's draw some dashes to let people know that they are indeed riding a bike and they're going fast and they're zooming by. And now the only thing we're missing is a drawing for something in the basket. And I think it's going to be a little kitten right here. I'm drawing the helmet first so I don't forget it. And they're going so fast, the eyes are sort of closed, kind of squinting with all the air all the wind in his eyes. All right, there's our kitty. There we go. All right. So even though I drew this with a pencil by myself, it was thanks to all your ideas and all you were sharing that I was able to create them. So thank you. That is the power of coming together and working even if we are at a distance. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I will come back to you and hear from you in case you have any questions. If I can answer anything, I would be happy, happy to hear from you. Oh, all right, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Juana. That was amazing. 
Um, I love everything that you created. I know everyone in the chat seemed to be very enthusiastic as well. Um, we are going to turn to questions now. So if you have a question for Juana, please put it in the Q and A. Um, one question that we have is how did you get your book published? Mm, what a great question. So first, I have I, I've always loved stories. I think that they're very, very powerful and moving. And since I was very little, I started making my own books. Even when I was seven, I, I first um, worked on a book that was about how much I loved swimming. That book never got published, but that's okay. Some books never get published. I think my mom has it still. Um, but I think the first book I got published was because someone was familiar with my illustrations and they invited me to illustrate a book and then another and then another. Uh, and I had the story uh, that I remembered from childhood and uh, I remember writing a very short story and I thought it would be for class at school and that would be it. Uh, but I started sharing it with friends and it sort of snowballed into something bigger. And little by little, it got in front of a publisher and another publisher and another publisher. And I decided to work with Candlewick Press. And I'm very lucky to work with them because they have a very thoughtful team that has helped me put together the books using the exact words to describe the things that I want and to find the best way to share through drawings the things that are happening in the story. And so even though it is my name that appears on the book, it's actually a big team behind each book, um, ensuring that everything comes together as best as possible. So it was a, a long answer to a very thoughtful question. Thank you. All right. And we have a question also about uh, how did you learn how to draw and how did you learn how to draw so many different things? Ah, that is such an important question. I started drawing very, very young when I was little. And I still find it a bit of a mystery. I don't entirely know why, but I think a lot of children stop drawing around the time they're seven or eight or nine. Um, and I do hope that those of you that are joining us today will not stop drawing when you are at those ages or a little bit older. Um, because if you keep drawing, you keep getting better and better at it. And that's what happened. I, I kept drawing. I didn't stop drawing. Um, and, uh, and even though there are many things I don't know how to draw, like this morning, someone was asking me to draw, um, uh, a, um, a, an ATV, which I didn't have that much luck drawing. Um, so I still have to work on it, but just as, I, as when I was a kid, I was trying to figure out how to best draw it and trying and trying and trying again. That's, that's how I've gotten better and better at drawing. Thank you for that question. Excellent. Um, so we have another question. Uh, someone wants to know how long did this book take from start to finish? Uh, and it's actually a two-part question. They are also curious to know um, about your incorporation of Spanish into the text and, and what led you to that decision. Such a good question. So this book uh, took about hmm, about two and a half, three years. Uh, and I, I think it is, it, it, I pause in it, I, I, to think of, uh, about it because I was working on big problemas when I started thinking about muchos changes. And so I had been thinking about this book even before starting it really. Um, and so it's hard to figure out when exactly I started thinking of this book, but uh, it has been a process. Um, and the other part of the question was about Spanish. Spanish is my first language. It's the first language that I learned to speak. I've been speaking Espanol since before I could understand what language I was speaking. Um, and so it was helpful to use it because it allowed me to say things um, that came perhaps a little bit easier than in English uh, and to make sure that we can always remember even when we are on page, you know, 53 or 74, whatever it is of the book that Juana lives in Colombia and that we're reading the story of someone who generally thinks in Spanish. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for that question. Um, all right, and so a related question actually is, uh, what was the inspiration for Juana? Uh, and 
since it, I think the answer is that it was partly based on your your own experience as a child, right? Um, tell us about skate camp also. Ah, uh, okay. So yes, it is inspired in things that happened to me growing up. Juana and Lucas, the whole series is inspired in things that happened to me when I was a kid. And I think it is important for me to share here that when I was growing up in Colombia, most of the stories I was reading as a child were about boys and also about boys that were growing up in places that were very far and removed from Colombia. And so for the longest time, I felt like my story did not belong in books, that it, books were not meant for people that looked or, or had a life like mine. Uh, and with time, thankfully, I realized that I was incorrect, that that's not true, and that there's plenty of room for very many different stories in children's books, thankfully. And so that's why I try to share so much, especially with young readers, the importance of them sharing their stories, even if it is about something like skating camp. And so um, I wasn't that curious about skating. I'm a very clumsy human being. I tend to fall very easily. And so I, that worried me. And to make things a little more complicated, my parents uh, bought me these skates that were these very strange contraptions. So they didn't quite look like anybody else's skates, which made me feel a little too self-aware. Um, but it all worked out and I did my skating. And moreover, I made great friends. I don't skate anymore, but I'm in touch with some of them still, uh, which I think is more important. Um, and uh, I think that it, it, it taught me in many ways to try new things and to, and to, and to see that there's much to learn. Uh, whether it relates to skating or other things. Yeah. That is awesome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. We have a question from a group of first grade and ELL learners who want to know how you learned to write so well. Oh, just like skating or like drawing by practicing and practicing and practicing. And one of the coolest things about writing is that a really good way to get better at writing is by reading. So you get to enjoy so many books and to I get to enjoy so many books by fellow authors that I look at and I see and I'm like, how are they so talented? How did they figure out these words to make it so funny or so moving or even so sad or haunting or scary, whatever it is, but just to find the perfect words to describe something. Um, and to convey it and to make the reader feel a certain way. I find that very special. And so I think um, for young readers, I invite them to read as much as they write, um, hoping that they will find much inspiration and big challenges to find new ways of writing. Awesome, thank you. And we have some great comments in the Q&A also from uh, one person who says, I want to be an author, another person who says that they have made a book as well. So oh, I hope you wonderful. all keep that up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So um, we also have a question about how did you come up with character names besides Juana? Mm -hmm. um, so it, I think one very hard thing for me while working on Juana and Lucas has been which characters to keep and which to sort of put back in the background or to not add to the story. Because in reality, I have so many cousins that I would still be working on the first book if I added everybody. So I needed to just choose a few people and have those people sort of represent overall people in my life. Um, and so mommy is how I've called my mom always. And so I kept on calling her mommy. Um, Juana is my name. Lucas was my dog's name. So those I didn't really change or they're true to, re to reality. Um, and, uh, then there were names like, for example, the Herrera brothers, uh, and it, it, they were not called the Herrera brothers, but they, they did have a shop and they used to bicker a lot. And, uh, Herrera is the last name of, of a dear friend from childhood. So I decided to call them the Herrera brothers for her or, um, the, my neighbors, the Sheldons, their last name was not Sheldon, but, um, while I was a student in Providence, a number of friends uh, used to live on Sheldon Street. And uh, 
we would always meet at Sheldon and Sheldon became sort of this over welcoming place for all of us to meet. And I decided to honor that street uh, by calling my neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Sheldon, just because I had so much fun on Sheldon Street in Providence with so many friends. So many different places from very different life experiences. Yeah. Excellent. And there's a related question, actually, which is what are the other personal touches in your books that kind of uh, are going back to something in your past? Um, oh, so many times I try to put within books things that are important to me. So, for example, there are very little details, but um, in the first Juana and Lucas, this person running right here is just a passerby. She's also my wife. Uh, and so I decided to draw her into the book, having a run around Bogota, which is something that she would do while we were visiting Bogota. And also for me to sort of wave hi and say, Sally, thank you so much for feeding me and being such a good companion while I was working on this book. And so there are details like that throughout the books. Um, some of the cars, for example, are based on the cars that my parents had when I was growing up. Uh, some of the details within the houses are details that my grandparents had or that were in my parents' house um, because I feel nostalgic. There are places in Colombia I'll never be able to visit again. They don't exist anymore, like my childhood uh, house. And so um, that was a way for me to find, again, some comfort in finding them again in some sort of version, even, even if I was just drawing them. Thanks for that question. Excellent. All right. So a really great question uh, that I was going to ask you, but someone else mm -hmm. has put the question in the chat as well. So I feel better now. Um, but someone wants <laughs> to know, how do I become an artist? And you mentioned going to school in Providence. So tell us more about that. Right. So to tell you the truth, I grew up in a family where if pretty much almost everybody drew or did some artistic thing. So my aunt did pottery. My grandmother was a carpenter. My grandfather was a brain surgeon, but he was very, very good at drafting and drawing. So I always thought growing up that everybody drew. And when somebody said, would say to me, no, 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 I don't draw, I'd be like, what is it? Do you need a pencil or paper? Why can't you draw? Um, and little by little, I realized that not everybody has talent to draw, just like I don't have the talent for skating or for math necessarily. Um, it doesn't mean I won't try it, but, you know, some of us are a little more skilled than others uh, at certain or adept at certain things. And drawing comes sort of easy to me, and it's something that I enjoy greatly. It took me a long time, and I think for a long time I didn't have the confidence to realize that it was something I could do and that I could share with the world. So it took me a while, and going to art school helped me gain skills and practice and a better understanding of drawing and little by bit little I've been building that confidence so that I can share those drawings with all of you yeah so I would hope that whoever wants to become an artist just puts in all the work and sometimes it's intimidating and sometimes it's exhausting um, but it's worth trying definitely and we have a lot of questions in the Q&A about how old you were when you first knew you were going to be an artist and also when you first wrote your first book. Okay, so the first book I wrote, I think as I shared earlier, was about swimming. Um, and I was about seven years old and it remains unpublished, but it helped me realize how much I loved stories and how important they were to me. And so I have kept on thinking of how important stories were. It wasn't until I was, 25 or so that I first illustrated a book to be published. Um, and from there on that has led from one project and another and people see the illustrations and they're interested in working with me, which is always an honor, truly. It's quite flattering when I receive an invitation to illustrate something. Um, so it, it varies. I mean, I can't say, I mean, now I'm 41 and I'm still interested in, in working in more projects. And I hope that when I'm 88, I'm still interested in working on some illustrated projects. So I don't think it relates too much to age as, a, as it relates to how interested you are in pursuing something. 
Yeah, great takeaway. Thank you. Um, <laughs> someone in the Q and A would like to know what your biggest challenge has been as an author. Mm, my biggest challenge as an author. I think the biggest challenge for me is to realize that I have limited amounts of time and to know how to best make use of that time so that I can work as best as possible without working until four in the morning, which is something that sometimes can be good, but not every night. And also to make sure that I'm making time to rest and to take good care of myself and to make friends and to stay you know, alive in many different ways. So I think that is my biggest challenge, trying to figure out how to best make use of my time. Yeah. Awesome. All right, uh, we're down to just a few minutes left. So I'm looking through the questions that are here. Um, here's one, what was your favorite book when you were growing up? Ah, what a great question. There are a, a number of books and it's very, very hard for me to point to just one but I will share a few that were particularly moving and special. There's one book called Colombia, Mi Abuelo y Yo, Colombia, My Grandfather and I, or me. Um, and it was very special because the illustrations were gorgeous. Um, and it allowed me to see, just as I was saying earlier, there weren't that many books about Colombia to see my my country represented in a book. And that was very special. And I still have that book with me and I still go and look at it and, and find things that are very special and inspiring to me. I also loved, and I still love um, The Little Prince um, and a book that is very hard to find in the US for some reason called Momo by Michael Ande, who's uh, the, the author of uh, The Never Ending Story, which is a little better known here. But I definitely, speaking about time and how we use time, I definitely recommend that you check out Momo. And uh, I also loved uh, Little Nicholas um, uh, by Grosini and Sempe. Um, and I could look at those illustrations forever. I just love those books. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, one other question that we've gotten a couple times is whether you've considered writing a book completely in Spanish. Well, funny you should ask. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working right now as I, I was sharing with the uh, bicycle. I'm working right now on a book about an elephant. Uh, it's called Elena Rides and it's about an elephant learning how to ride a bike. Um, and we are working right now on the translation in Spanish, uh, which is very, very exciting to me. Um, and also Juan and Lucas was translated uh, with the great help of Alexis Romay and uh, it came out late last year. And I am just thrilled to see Juan and Lucas in Spanish because uh, it sent me back into childhood and it made me feel again that thrill for a book um, and there was something particularly special of seeing for the first time my story and to find myself in a book in a way that I had never been able to experience. So it, it might have been a bit of a selfish pleasure, but it was it was very <laughs> moving for me to have that opportunity. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so this might be our last question, um, <laughs> but it's a combination of questions from the Q&A, uh, which uh, so Basically, what is the most important thing you do to prepare when you're trying to write a new story? How do you plan out your stories? And what would you advise, what kind of advice would you give to anyone who's listening or watching who wants to be able to share their own story? It's a big question. That's an important <laughs> question. Yeah, it's a great way to end. I think one of the most important and yet hardest things to do is to ask for feedback. Ask people what they think about your story. And I am, again, very, very lucky to work with an extraordinary team of people that are very thoughtful and incredibly smart. Um, and it's intimidating to ask them, you know, I'll send them my drafts and, and then I'll ask sort of shyly, so send me your thoughts. I look forward to hearing from you, but it's always, you don't know what is going to happen. And then I'll receive the feedback. And without a doubt, 
most time, I would say every single time I've received feedback from them, I've always had this feeling of, oh, that's brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? And so I think that is incredibly powerful to make sure that you surround yourselves with people that are interested in making the best story possible. And so it is not about your story where you feel like it's mine and it has to stay. So it's not your baby, but instead it is a story that you are trying to make very cohesively so that people will understand and enjoy it as best as possible. And that, just as we did with the illustrations with all your help, is what the magic that happens when we work as a team. Yeah, I'm so glad we were able to finish with that question. Yeah, that was just a fantastic way to wrap up everything that you've been saying. And we are just so thrilled that you were able to join us today. Thank you, Anna. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you to everybody for joining us. And thank you, Virginia Festival of the Book and Sarah for hosting me. Yeah. Well, thank you. And yes, thank you to everyone who's watching. Um, please remember that you can visit vabook.org to explore our full schedule of upcoming Virginia Festival of the Book events, including another event with Juana. You won't want to miss it. Uh, all of that is taking place later this month, uh, actually next week. And so thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.